Chain, by Lee with George. We now come to the big moment of the Honourable Lady for Loughborough. Weeks of anticipation are now at an end, and I call on her to move New Clause 16. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Holloway. This is indeed a pleasure to sp speak before you today yeah. uh, and to move my new clause 16. I recently met with members of the Leicestershire Police Federation who informed me of the association's concerns regarding Part 3 of the Data Protection Act 2018, which is imposing unnecessary and burdensome redaction ob obligations on the police service and taking them away from the front line. I would like to thank the Police Federation for providing me with the information I'm going to discuss today and for drafting the amendment I have tabled. Part 3 of the 2018 Act implemented the Law Enforcement Directive and makes provision for data processing by competent authorities, including police forces and the Crown Prosecution Service, for law enforcement purposes. However, although Recital 4 of the Law Enforcement Directive emphasised that the free flow of personal data between competent authorities for the purposes of the prevention, investigation, detection or prosecution of criminal offences should be facilitated while ensuring a high level of protection of personal data, Part 3 of the 2018 Act contains no provisions at all to facilitate the free flow of personal data between the police and the CPS. Instead, Part 3 imposes burdensome obligations on the police which require them to redact personal data from information transferred to the CPS. These obligations are only delaying and obstructing the expeditious progress of the criminal justice system and were not even mandated in the Law Enforcement Directive. This problem has arisen due to Chapter 2 of Part 3, which sets out six data protection principles that, as I have already mentioned, apply to data processing by competent authorities for law enforcement purposes. Section 35 brackets 1 states that the first data protection principle is that the processing of personal data for any of the law enforcement purposes must be lawful and fair. And section 35 2 states that the processing of personal data for any of the law enforcement purposes is lawful only if and to the extent that it is based on law and either a the data subject is given consent to the processing for that purpose, or B, the processing is necessary for the performance of a task carried out for that purpose by a competent authority. The Police Federation has said that it is very unlikely that Section 35.2a will apply in this context. They have also said that in the case of Section 35.2b, the test of whether the processing is necessary is an exacting one, requiring a competent authority to apply its mind to the proportionality of processing specific items of personal data for the particular law enforcement purpose in question. Under section uh, 35, 3 to 5, where the processing is sensitive processing, an even more rigorous test applies, requiring, amongst other things, that the processing is strictly necessary for the law enforcement purpose in question. Section 37 goes on to state that the third data protection principle is that personal data processed for any of the law enforcement purposes must be adequate, relevant and not excessive in relation to the purpose for which it is processed. For the purposes of the 2018 Act, the CPS and each police force are separate competent authorities and separate data controllers. Therefore, as set out in Section 34.3, the CPS and each police force must comply with the data protection principles. A transfer of information by a police force to the CPS amounts to the processing of personal data. The tests of necessary and strictly necessary under the first data protection principle and the third data protection principle require a competent authority to identify and consider each and every item of personal data contained within information it is intended to pro intending to process and to consider whether it is necessary for that item of personal data to be processed in the manner intended. The Police Federation have explained that when the police are preparing a case for file for submission to the CPS for a charging decision, the practical effect of this is that they have to spend huge amounts of time and resources going through the information which has been gathered by investigating officers in order to identify every single item of personal data contained within that information. They also have to decide whether it is necessary, or in many cases strictly necessary, 
for the CPS to consider each item of personal data when making its charging decision and redacting every item of personal data which does not meet this test. Furthermore, the National Police Chiefs Council and the CPS have produced detailed guidance on this redaction process which emphasises that the 2018 Act is a legal requirement and that the police and CPS do not have any special relationship that negates the need to redact and protect personal information. The combination of the guidance's requirements and the Acts represents a huge amount of administrative work for police officers, resulting in hours of preparing appropriate redactions. Picture the scene. An incident occurs, 10 police officers go to the incident. As they arrive, they all turn on their body cams, body worn cams. Um, they speak to different people, have different view backgrounds of the cameras. Um, they gather all sorts of different data. They gather CCTV footage, a ring go footage, you name it, and then have to redact each of that in real time afterwards. It can take weeks uh, for just one incident to be dealt with. This burden is highlighted in the Attorney General's Office 2022 Annual Review of Disclosure, which recorded evidence from all members of the justice system, but especially the police, that redaction of material for disclosure is placing a significant pressure on resources and that one police force had invested £1 million in a disclosure specialist team solely to deal with redaction. Furthermore, inevitably, this work is carried out by relatively junior officers who have no particular expertise in data protection, and much of it may never be used by the CPS if the matter is not charged or the defendant pleads guilty before trial. Nationally, around 25% of cases that are submitted to the CPS are not charged. A significant proportion of this time and money could therefore be saved if the redaction of personal data by the police occurred after rather than before a charging decision has been made by the CPS. This is exactly what the amendment I have tabled to the Data Protection and Digital Information No. 2 Bill would do, as it inserts a clause into the 2018 Act which exempts the police service and the CPS from complying with the first data principle, except in so far as that principle requires processing to be fair, or the third data protection principle when preparing a case file for submission to the CPS for a charging decision thereby facilitating the free flow of personal data between the police and the CPS. Where the CPS decide to charge, the case file would be returned to the police to carry out the redaction exercise before there is any risk of the file being disclosed to any personal body other than the CPS. In the 25% of cases where the CPS decide not to charge, the redacted file would simply be deleted by the CPS. My amendment would have no obvious disadvantages as the security of the personal data would not be compromised and the necessary redactions would still be undertaken once a charging decision has been made. Furthermore, there are already provisions in the Data Protection and Digital Information No. 2 Bill which are designed to reduce the burden Part 3 of, uh, sorry, reduce the burden Part 3 of the 2018 Act imposes on law enforcement bodies. For example, as we have previously discussed, Clause 16 reduces the burden of the log, uh, logging obligation in Section 62 of the 2018 Act. The impact of these other provisions would be greatly enhanced if my amendment was also included within the Bill. It is crucial that we do everything, everything we can to ease the administrative burdens on police officers so that we can free up thousands of policing hours and get police back onto the front line supporting communities and tackling crime. My amendment would go a long way to achieving this by facilitating the free flow of personal data between the police and the CPS, which would speed up the criminal justice process and reduce the burden on the taxpayer. I do hope not to have to push this to the vote, and I hope that the Minister will be able to provide some encouragement that, we'll issue, that this issue will be moved forward to resolution during the process of this bill. Thank you. The processing of data in relation to a case file prepared by the police service for submission to the Crown Prosecution Service for a charging decision. The question is that new clause 16 be read a second time. Stephanie Peacock. Uh, thank you, you Chair. Uh, this new clause amends section 40 of the Data Protection Act 2018, allowing for police services to share un. Uh, redacted data with the Crown Prosecution Services when we're making a charging decision. 
Uh, I'm incredibly sympathetic to the aim that the Honourable mem uh, Member just set out, which is to get the police as much as possible fighting crime on the front line. Uh, during our oral evidence sessions, Amy Reid, Director of Data at the Metropolitan Police, said that it would be of considerable benefit if the police could share information redacted before charging <coughs> decisions were made. She said it would enable better and easier charging decisions as well as to reduce the current burden on officers, allowing them to focus their time on other things. It's therefore good to see this concept explored in an amendment. In order to determine the value of this change, um, we'd like to see a full impact assessment on the potential risks and harms associated with it, um, and hopefully that could be conducted with the intention of weighing this against the actual cost of the current burden police face in redacting data. I think without uh, such an assessment, it's harder to determine whether the benefit to the police would be proportionate to the impact or harms that might occur as a result of this change, particularly for the subject of data, uh, subjects of data involved. Of course, this is not to say that any change wouldn't be beneficial, just that perhaps more detail uh, could be explored with regard to this proposal. Um, as I believe this is the final time I will be speaking as committee. Yes, um, there is another section to come. There is another section. Uh, okay. Can I, with the indulgence of the chair, say a few words of thanks, or would that come? I think you should wait for the next question. Okay, I will wait for the next question. Thank you for guidance, chair. Please, um, thank you. Uh, can I start by thanking my honourable friend, who has been assiduous in pursuing this point and has set out very clearly the purposes behind her new clause, and we completely share her wish to see. Uh, as much reduction in un unnecessary burdens on the police as is possible. Um, and the purpose of her amendment seeks to uh, achieve this uh, in relation to the preparation by police officers of pre-charge files. Uh, and this is an issue that the National Police Chiefs Council has also raised with the Home Office, as I think she knows. Um, it is a serious matter for our police forces, who estimate that around four hours are spent redacting a typical case file, and who argue that if this burden is reduced, it will obviously enable officers to spend more time on frontline policing. And we completely understand the frustration that many officers will feel about having to spend a, a huge amount of time on what they see as unnecessary redaction. Uh, I can assure my honourable friend that the Home Office is working with partners in the criminal justice system to find ways of safely reducing the redaction burden while still maintaining public trust. Uh, and I think it is important that we give them the time to do so. Uh, we need to resolve this issue through an evidence-based solution, but it will ensure the right amount of redaction is done at the right point in the process in order to reduce any delays while still maintaining victim and witness confidence in the process. So if I can assure my honourable friend that she, the point she makes is very well taken on board by the government, uh, and we are certainly looking to find out what we can do to achieve her objective uh, as quickly as possible, but I hope she will accept that at this point uh, it would be sensible to withdraw this clause. Jane Hunt. Thank you very much, Mr. Hollowbone. And I thank the Minister a uh, great deal for what he's uh, said today and the time and effort that's being put in by several departments in order to uh, draw attention and bring this uh, to a conclusion. Um, I, I am happy that some progress has been made and therefore I will withdraw the amendment at this time but reserve my right to bring it back at a later date. Thank you. Does anyone object to new clause 16 being withdrawn? New clause 16 by leave withdrawn. Members will be disappointed 